For this last segment, we're going to talk a little bit about the history of sociology. We have said that sociology is the scientific study of human social behavior, but uh, humans have been behaving socially for um, 150,000 years. Modern human beings uh, anatomically and mentally like us have been around for 150,000 years. But sociology was born in Europe in the 19th century. So sociology has been around for less than 0.001% of human history. How come sociology was discussed? How did sociology emerge? Well, the answer to this is that certain things had to happen in order for society to become visible to people. For most of human history, uh, so, uh, society and sociological processes were hidden from our view. They were uh, sort of transparent to us. Uh, and the best way to sort of explain this is uh, something said by the anthropologist Ralph Linton. And what Linton said was that the last thing in the world a fish would ever notice would be water. Now, think about that for a minute. Uh, and what he was trying to say is that in our natural state, the last thing human beings would ever notice would be society, because society is essentially, you know, the water we swim in. And so something happened. Uh, there were, uh, in the 19th century, uh, some rapid and momentous cataclysmic social changes uh, made us fish out of water, threw us out of our natural way of living, and uh, revealed the processes of society to us. And the founders of the discipline of sociology were all active during this time of social ferment. Uh, we call it uh, the Industrial Revolution or the Enlightenment. It's a period of transition from animal labor to machine labor. In agrarian uh, economies, you use animal labor. That's the, the, the transportation by horse, plow by ox, uh, herding sheep with dogs. The best technology that you have um, in an agricultural society is essentially the beast of burden. And when the beast gave way to the machine, when the horse gave way to the car and the uh, ox gave way to the tractor, uh, things changed rapidly. Uh, and there were four catalysts of this change that threw us out of the water. And I'm going to go through them. Uh, they're largely in chronological order, but they sort of overlap. And they are the age of discovery, urbanization, rapid technological change, and then we'll sort of give a general overview of enlightenment. The age of discovery was a period where Europeans came in contact with people outside their immediate sphere of influence. They began to travel around the world and encounter cultures that were different from their own. Uh, we famously think of, erroneously think of, Christopher Columbus as the discoverer of uh, America in 1492. We read about Marco Polo's travels to China. So these Europeans began to come in contact with the people in the Americas, people in Asia, people in Africa, and they noticed, you know, these people have functioning societies, but they do things differently. They have different kinship systems. They have different cuisines. They have different customs. They have different gods. Uh, and so how do you explain these functioning societies that do things so different than we do? And it began to occur to some European philosophers that society is a malleable human construction, that there's not one sole way to organize uh, human communities, human groups, that there's um, all kinds of different ways, and that our way of socialization, social organization, is just one way. Okay. So that really opened up the mind to uh, different ways of living. Another process that opened up the mind 
to different ways of living is urbanization. The process of industrialization that I described earlier uh, prompted people to move from the farms and the villages and into the cities. And this caused a transfer transformation from traditional rural agrarian social forms to more urban social forms. Now I have here uh, a model of what your life might have been like in a traditional agrarian village. Uh, and these villages were characterized by a great deal of homogeneity. Um, everybody that lived in them uh, was essentially alike. Uh, here I have different uh, spheres, this U in the middle, and the dark blue uh, circle is the set of all people who live in close proximity to you, your village. The light blue circle, uh, the set of all people who share your theology. The uh, orange circle, the set of all people who are related to you in one way or another, through extended family, either through blood or marriage. The red circle, people who share your ethnicity. The green circle, people who share your language. And what you see is that there's massive overlap in all of these things. Different aspects of society uh, flow into one another so that there really isn't any kind of distinction between ethnic solidarity and religious solidarity. And there's no real difference between um, a, uh, a family tradition and a religious ritual. Uh, so uh, there, there really was no distinction between the religious and the ethnic and the familial. So people were enmeshed in these homogeneous villages where everybody knew everybody else and everybody was essentially the same. Now in villages like this, there's a high degree of consensus. People don't question traditional ways because there are no competing ideologies. But when people from these or homogeneous villages began to move into the cities, things began to change. You can see the difference between the traditional society on the left and the modern society on the right. In the modern society, all of your social circles are not consolidated they are more sort of cross-cutting. So think about the people who live in your neighborhood. Those are the people who live in close proximity to you. Are those the people you go to church with? Not necessarily. Do they share your ethnicity? Well, most or maybe some. Are they related to you? Probably not, right? So in the city, you have um, all kinds of cross-cutting circles where you know this person here might share my ethnicity but we belong to different religions or this person here uh, might share my ethnicity but we speak a different language or this person here uh, is kin to me but they live far away and these heterogeneous societies erode the power of tradition and the reason why they erode the power of tradition is that because in this setting, uh, traditional norms and traditional values can't explain the world. Who's are we going to pick? Uh, everybody comes from somewhere else. Uh, so there are sort of multiple vantage points in society. I always, whenever I teach a large section of sociology 101, I always tell the students, you know, in this room today, right now, there is someone who is pro-life and believes that abortion is murder. And that person could be very well sitting next to someone who is pro-choice and thinks that a woman should be able to have an abortion at any time for any reason. That's the kind of diversity in opinion that you can see in one room. Uh, it's completely, you know, our, there, there aren't very many social issues in the United States today where uh, there is any kind of consensus we all disagree we all have our own ideas and so there has to be some sort of social form or some sort of state or some sort of government uh, that enforces order because you know our traditional values uh, simply can't order society anymore and this is the kind of thing that 
brought the processes of social organization to the fore. Sociologists began to notice, huh, you know, uh, the things that we believe are no longer taken for granted. They are contested. And that's, you know, the, that's the fish being out of water. You start to notice society. Okay. The next thing that happened was rapid technological change. If you uh, are an anthropologist or a historian, you will know that we sometimes date historical eras by the type of technology that dominated in that era. Uh, we talk about the Stone Age, and uh, after that came uh, an age of copper tools and then one of iron. It took centuries for the Bronze Age to morph into the Iron Age, it, it, you know, literally millennia to go from. And so uh, anthropologists can look at, they can date archeological sites by looking at fish hooks or the structure of an olive press. I mean, they can look at these technologies and date the site to within a couple hundred years because that's how slow technology moved. The technology that you use in a traditional society is generally the same technology that your dad used, that your granddad used, that your great granddad, used, that everybody used, you know, going back into the mists of time and going forward to subsequent generations before the era of urbanization and uh, industrialization. Uh, everything stayed the same. There, there was no real sort of generation gap because the, the technology that is uh, relevant to you is relevant to your parents and relative to your children well that's obviously out the window now uh you know when i remember when i was uh, a kid uh, no older than my son is now my father who was an engineer brought home one of the first solid state calculators uh, that was run by battery and uh, i remember you know being amazed that it could compute square roots with just a button Right. So this was in the mid 70s. And I asked my dad, hey, dad, can I play with it? And he said, yeah, but be careful with it because it costs a thousand dollars. And I'll never forget thinking, oh, what a great device this is because it costs a thousand dollars. Well, think about the computer that you can buy today for a thousand dollars and think about its computational ability relative to that silly calculator. It's a massive change in technology. Uh, in one human lifetime, we went from the Wright brothers at Kitty Hawk to the space shuttle. That, that you know, there were people who uh, were alive when Kitty Hawk flew, the very first flight. Uh, people who were alive when the space shuttle blasted off. That's that is how much technological change now exists in one lifetime. And what ends up happening here is that that technology needs to be integrated into society. And when you integrate that technology into society, the society is going to change. The rules, the norms, the customs, the values, the traditions that are appropriate for one sort of technological situation don't work for a subsequent technological situation. Right? Let, think about just change in your lifetime, my lifetime, right? Uh, I like these old computer ads. On the left here, you can see the hard disk you've been waiting for, 10 megabytes. 10 megabytes is about enough memory for two songs, as long as they aren't sampled in super high quality, right? You could fit two pop songs on that 10 megabyte hard disk. And how much does it cost? $3,398. Whereas now you have uh, uh, 200 gigabytes on a little tiny card the size of your thumbnail. Now, you, if you think about the incredible technological advance that represents, you should also think about the massive amount of change that this has necessitated in our society. Okay? On the left, you see, uh, uh, a 20 megahertz, now computer speed is measured in gigahertz, uh, computer 
uh, new for 1989. You realize I was a grown man in 1989, and in 1989, if I had had $8,500, I probably would have bought that fantastic state-of-the-art computer system. On the right, I just went to the web and grabbed a, a, a price off Newegg for a laptop. Here's a little laptop uh, that sells brand new for $176. And that $176 uh, laptop is so much more powerful than the computer on the left that it is not even worth comparison. I mean, it's just orders of magnitude more powerful. And think of what this has done for uh, uh, our ideas about copyright law. Think of what it's done uh, for the exchange of information and the proliferation of information. Think of what, it, what it's done for um, uh, human sexuality. You know, I mean, not to be crass, but I mean, think about the changes in human sexuality that have occurred because of the Internet. So what happens is... Uh, in society, technology moves so fast that our laws can't keep up. A lot of times people complain about activist judges that uh, make law from the bench and people decry activist judges who make law from the bench. But there's a reason why judges make law from the bench. It's because legislatures can't go fast enough to keep up with how quickly technology has changed. Uh, my favorite example of this is a uh, when I lived in New Jersey, a man and a woman were married and they wanted to have kids, but she was at a very pivotal point in her career and so it wasn't the right time. But she wanted to have children, but she was getting older. And so what happened is they took some of her eggs and fertilized them with his sperm and then they had them cryogenically frozen. And the plan was to implant these cryogenically frozen eggs into a surrogate so that they could have their own biological offspring, even if she was post-menopause, okay? So that's what happens. And you have these, uh, you know, these kid sickles on ice. And what happens? The couple divorces. And a custody battle ensues over these frozen zygotes. Now, there is no law to cover this. There is no statute that a jurist can point to for how to handle this. And you can see that it's clearly a thorny legal issue. On his end, he's saying like, now am I gonna be on the hook for child support here? And she's probably saying, you know, I want these because it's my only chance to have my own offspring. This is a classic example of how society moves so fast that laws can't keep up. Technology moves so fast that our values can't keep up. Think about the value of no premarital sex before marriage. Um, when I was uh, uh, a kid, that was drummed into me, uh, the idea that premarital sex is sinful. Well, you know, what percent of people in our society, what percent of people who espouse the idea that premarital sex is wrong are nevertheless virgins when they marry? And I would say not many. And the reason for that is that in ancient societies or in traditional societies, you got married when you became economically viable and when you were sexually mature. Now, in order to be a farmer or in order to herd sheep, uh, you know, there's not that much to learn. You can be a farmer or you can herd sheep when you're 17, 18 years old. And not surprisingly, People got married when they were 17, 18 years old. Asking people to refrain from sexual activity until they're 17, 18 years old seems pretty reasonable. Uh, how old are people when they are economically viable in this society? How old are people uh, when they marry in this society? So whenever people say, oh, this generation is so immoral, this generation is so profligate, uh, I don't buy it. Because asking people to abstain from sex until they're married in this society is asking a very different thing than asking people to refrain from sex, um, you know, 150, 200 years ago. And so people say, oh, traditional morality is crumbling. Well, uh, there's a reason why these traditional values are crumbling, because they're no longer relevant.
they, you know, a lot of people have decided that they don't work for our world. Uh, and this is this uh, this precariousness of uh, sort of human values, this uh, erosion uh, of the relevance um, of morality and of law uh, is the kind of thing that came to the attention of people who wanted to look at society analytically. And it was a catalyst for the birth of sociology and all of these changes. Uh, are under the rubric of what we call the Enlightenment. And uh, if I was to characterize the Enlightenment, I would say it was a search for um, uh, the a naturalistic explanation for the world, uh, for natural, you know, for for the natural phenomena that we see. Uh, and uh, instead of using theology to explain the world. We used observation and experiments uh, in order to investigate why things are the way they are. And uh, this was uh, very important to the sociologists who uh, wanted to look at naturalistic reasons why societies have norms and cultures, to look at uh, sort of the functions of religion, not to look at religion as something that's uh, revealed by uh, a god or a pantheon, but religion as a human institution that is designed to solve human problems. And uh, this is the reason why sociology is the way it is. It is uh, uh, a scientific inquiry into things that people don't want to believe are socially constructed. And uh, that's uh, the remnant of our Enlightenment heritage. So that's a little short primer on the social conditions that gave rise to sociology.